Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Amanda Stolman. I'm the USA Director for Keep Prison Single Sex. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition to Maryland House Bill 453. <clears throat> Why do we have separate prisons for men and women? Because everything you know, everything all of us know, without having to study biology or law, tells us that men and women as sex categories are physically different in size, in strength, the particulars of our bodies and bodily functions, and in reproduction. Gender identity compared to the stable category of sex is not objective, verifiable, or disprovable. One's gender identity does not transform one's sex. It is the stable objective category of sex, not the vague mutable category of gender identity, which should dictate prison housing placement. Now the Federal PREA Act, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act standards referred to previously, which Maryland adheres to, permits but does not compel cross-sex housing on the basis of transgender status. Under the PREA standards, such housing placement is contemplated following screening for a risk of victimization and in consideration of individual safety and health concerns. In contrast, Bill 453 is not grounded in a safety risk assessment. Rather, it's grounded in the mere preference of individuals in a multitude of self-declared gender identity categories. This fails to take into account the constitutional rights of your female inmates. Further, in Bill 453, anatomy explicitly may not be a reason to deny cross-sex housing. Other discriminatory reasons also may not be a basis to deny cross-sex housing. This would include legally protected mental disorders, which may include sexual paraphilias. No crimes render someone off limits for cross-sex housing in this bill. If you support this bill, you are signing on to males with intact genitalia or with sexual paraphilias or incarcerated for violent sex crimes or all of the above, being housed with women if that's their preference. That may sound outlandish, but those are all scenarios permitted under this bill and other states which have implemented similar law or policy are housing such males in women's prison. But even males who don't fall into any of those categories, men of any kind still remain male regardless of any gender identity. They absolutely deserve safety, but this should not come at the expense of your female inmates. They do not belong in women's prison. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jennifer Chavez and Maryland has been my home for the last 13 years. I'm a, also a member of the Women's Liberation Front, a progressive feminist organization fighting for the rights of women and girls. Our organization recently filed a lawsuit uh, challenging an almost identical law in federal um, court on behalf of several incarcerated women in California. We argue that the law imposes cruel and unusual punishment on incarcerated women, violates the equal protection laws, and also violates their First Amendment constitutional rights. I am against HB 453 because it would impose the same cruelty on women in Maryland. This bill states that an inmate shall be housed at a correctional facility designated for men or women based on the inmate's preference. So this bill would allow any incarcerated male the chance to gain access to vulnerable incarcerated women simply by claiming that he self-identifies as a woman or as non-binary. There's zero evidence that a man's subjective feelings about his so-called gender identity alter his propensity for violence. The problem with this is that male arrestees and convicted criminals have no place in women's prisons or jails ever. The fact that a male may be targeted by other violent men does not somehow mean that it's safe to house him with female inmates. The problem of male violence in men's facilities needs to be solved there. Women are not a therapeutic service for males. The women subject to this bill are already highly, highly vulnerable. A large majority of incarcerated women have suffered past physical and sexual abuse. Over 42% of incarcerated women are lesbian or bisexual. And as you heard earlier, they are more than 10 times as likely to be sexually victimized by other inmates and twice, more than twice as likely to be sexually victimized by staff. So before voting on this bill, bill, delegates need to know that women in places including Illinois, Washington, Canada, and England, and other places have been assaulted, sexually harassed, and raped by men who were allowed to be incarcerated in women's facilities based on their self-proclaimed gender identities. 
Uh, women, I'm sorry. Ms. Travis, I'm sorry. if you would begin to wrap up, please. Sure. Uh, one woman in California wrote about the terror this, that a similar bill caused her, saying, in my opinion, as an inmate and sexual abuse survivor, this is the most terrifying mistake made by people with power. It's irrational, inconsiderate, and malicious. Women's, again, end of quote, women's prisons don't exist to validate the feelings of a tiny number of- Ms. Travis, please. For these reasons, mm -hmm. I oppose HB 453. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon. I'm Casey. I've lived in Maryland for 12 years. I'm also on the, I'm on the board of Women's Liberation Front and strongly oppose House Bill 453. It claims to be anti-discriminatory about dignity, respect, but it would absolutely open a floodgate of men seeking to enter women's prisons, putting every female inmate at real and immediate risk. As a lesbian, the thought of being incarcerated with men makes chills run down my spine. And I'm honestly in disbelief that Maryland would even consider allowing males to be housed with females based on nothing more than his say so. Identifying as non binary or transgender does not change your biological sex. And this fringe notion based on what a feeling, sexist stereotypes, nothing at all will be one of the greatest embarrassments of our time. I'm a woman with short hair wearing a suit. Does that make me a man? Of course not. If I identified as a child to not pay my taxes, what about that? Or identified as black to receive a scholarship meant exclusively for people of color. What if I ran up to you, did a cartwheel, but identified as disabled, insisted that you refer to me that way? You would laugh at me. And I'd laugh at this proposed bill if its consequences weren't so serious because it will be men, violent, sick men, and many of them who will take advantage of this bill. And we are already seeing this play out in other states and countries, and it is not pretty. My heart goes out to all the women trying to heal from assault who will be re-traumatized under constant threat of, threat of rape. I worry about my lesbian and bi sisters who make up a disproportionate amount of female inmates and who are many times more likely to be victimized. And I think about female correctional officers forced to perform invasive body searches on males and cater to their whims. None of this sounds like dignity or respect to me. I urge you to oppose. Thank you. Are there questions for the panel? We'll begin with Delegate Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is for Ms. Mills. Could you just explain a little bit about the Women's Liberation Front? I had heard about it a couple years ago, but I, I haven't gotten any updates on that you know people might appreciate understanding what your group really does and what they're about yeah i think so much in a sentence we are a feminist a radical feminist organization that means going to the root of oppression thinking about it as a class of women these structural um oppressions that women face all women and we fight to protect the rights and boundaries of women and girls this is a really big issue we're dealing with, with right now. We are at the forefront of it in California. You can learn so much about it on our website and we are happy to talk to you more about it. Yeah, and ha did your group work on the issue of um, female erasure of la you know, language, that kind of issue? Okay, that helps clarify it. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Delegate Grammer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanted to ask uh, Ms. Mills, you had cited um, that this was a problem uh, both in, in other states and other countries. And it, it would be very helpful for me if I could read up a little bit about some of these cases, uh, the problems that we see. Is there any way you could maybe email me some information that I could kind of read up about the consequences of these policies? Absolutely, I can get it to you this afternoon. Thank you. Further questions for the panel in opposition? Delegate McComas. Um, just, just, I'm sorry. I think if, if you're going to send information, send it to all of us uh, because uh, th that would be very helpful. And, and also, um, since you all are engaged on this issue, if you could kind of, um, if you know kind of what, what size of population we're dealing with here. And, and maybe because it is a complicated issue and it's not you know, it's 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 not an easy way to, to do this. Why aren't the, the courts and let's say 
in other words, are the this the uh, criminal the crimes that are being committed by those that are transgender are they so serious that they have to be incarcerated? I mean, in other words, what I'm thinking is is that it's just you know the fact that they that these folks are going to prison is what is causing kind of the problem unless they are a danger to society and then you've got to deal with that. But in other words, if it's drunk driving or if it's you know drug addiction, th those all could have other workarounds. So, so I'm kind of curious as to how big a problem size-wise is this that we have to upend everything. So anyway, thank you. If, um, if I could speak to that, um, the current numbers for Maryland as of spring of 2021, in terms of your prison inmate population, which identifies as transgender, as of last spring, it was 38. Um, so I, I think the prior panel said 28, but I think that was referencing a, a number from an earlier year. So the most current I'm available, I'm aware of that's available is 38. To your question in terms of um, the types of crimes which are committed, um, I can't speak specifically to Maryland, um, but it may be illustrative to learn about um, data being collected by the Federal Bureau of Prisons, um, which does very carefully track the transgender inmates in their population. And what they have found, just by way of example, is that 48% of their transgender male population, so men who identify as women, 48% have been incarcerated for sex offenses. That compares to um, 11 some percent for their general population and compares to 4 point something percent for women who identify as males. So the, um, the, the rate of sex offense is four times that of the general population for the population which identifies as being a transgender female when they're male. I, I wonder if I could add a bit uh, more in response to that, Delegate McComas, sure, it's go ahead. really important to um, understand that this bill places absolutely no limitations on um, the, the, the individuals who can assert that they have a gender identity. Of course, we all know that the very nature of gender identity is that it's completely subjective, un, undis, unprovable, and of course, it's considered to be uh, a sign of bigotry if you question someone's assertion of gender identity. So there is absolutely no um, room for questioning the sincerity, um, nor is the severity of, of the individual's um, criminal conviction um, given any particular consideration. Um, all of the consideration is given to the subjective feelings of the inmate requesting uh, special placement. Uh, there's no particular explicit um, consideration given to the safety, privacy, or dignity of the female inmates. And of course, females have, um, as because of our, our fundamental biology, um, are susceptible to things that males are not, such as uh, impregnation. Um, and we're more susceptible to rape than males are because we're less able to fight them off. And so, um, you know, the, the, the way this bill is written, not that I would uh, support if it was narrower, but I want to make clear that it's extremely broad. Yeah, I would say in this case, do the numbers even matter? We would just see any man who previously had never spoke of a gender ID suddenly changing his tune whatever made it easier on him. That would absolutely happen and is happening. Further questions for the panel? Seeing none, we thank you all very much for testifying today. And that concludes the testimony on House Bill 453.